Does so anybody recognize themselves in this picture or maybe somebody else? Uh, I doubt it, right? <laughs> I think we all know what this is a photo of. It's a, a photo of immigrants. I don't know, circa 1980 or 1890s, 1910, someplace in there. Uh, and these are people who have, for some reason or other, have decided they're going to make this grand trip, this, this challenging trip, this uh, giving or walking away from everything they have known, everything that they have trusted in, and, and all of this uh, to find uh, new hope, a new life, a, a new place to live. And what's interesting is, is um, uh, a number of us helped my son and my daughter move over this week, and, and they had these two large moving trucks. And of course, they, they're not going to leave that stuff there, but uh, these people don't come over with large moving trucks. Every single thing that they have and all their possessions are, are with them right now, right? I wouldn't be surprised if they're just wearing two or three sets of clothes because they can't pack them all in the suitcase. I don't know. But anyway, uh, look at this photo here. This is um, a ship that is about to uh, either probably let the passengers off. I'm not saying they've made that trip from Europe, most likely, all on sh top deck like this. They're likely, many of them are downstairs or in their cubby holes or their little cabins or whatever they were able to afford. But, you know, can you imagine making these kind of trips? You, you think about what must be in, on their mind and, and the, you know, what were they looking for in life? Were they looking for a chance to improve life? Obviously, were they looking for to get away from some kind of dangerous thing? And, and that could very well have been the case uh, uh, back then even as it is today when people have to try, uh, feel the need to leave their home, their country because their family's in danger. And uh, here's another picture. I, I kind of like this one here because it, it's just, you know, there's hope in those faces, believe it or not. Uh, if you can look, I know it's kind of a blurry picture there, but as I looked at that photo, you see these little smiles, these hopes. They're finally getting off that bo boat and they're, they're walking into a new world and a new uh, life and such forth like that. And of course, ultimately, now this is a more modern photo of people being sworn into citizenship. The reason I wanted to bring this up today is because it really is a spiritual picture of what we go through as we leave this kind of old world, this old home that we lived in, and we move into this new life, uh, a new hope, and uh, it's with God as God makes his home in us. And of course, that's the, the title to this message today here. But I want you to think about a second here, and that is, for these people, and you see it today, people crossing the border today, whether it's uh, trying to get across the, from North Africa, the Mediterranean Sea, into Europe, and hopefully maybe even to Great Britain, or crossing the border at our, at our southern border. I'm not making any judgment upon that. I'm just making this as an illustration. People are leaving something for some, that, they, that is hard, difficult, and even life-threatening. They're trying to go someplace where there is hope perhaps fulfillment of life and, and a, a safer place to live. And that is our spiritual journey too. We walk away from something because we, we think this is not good. And hopefully that is what you remember. You, you go back and say, my present situation is hopeless. I've got, I'm broken. I have sin in my life. Uh, I can live in this world, but there is no fulfillment in it. There's no hope. And if I want to enter into this place, this new land, this new home to live, I'm going to have to make this journey. But it's not always an easy journey. But it's a journey worth taking. Well, today we're going to be looking about this idea that God is making his home in us. In fact, I, I question my use of the word making because it seems to to imply that it's not done. But in fact, it really is done. It really is complete. And that's what we're going to see in Colossians chapter 2 today. It is complete. What the making is about is us making ourselves aware of it and living as if it is true. So grab your Bible or take, open, take a hold of your Bible and open up to Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to be in verses 8 through 15. Uh, if you're using the Bible in the seat in front of you, I'm going to be on page 984, Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And in this passage, we're going to see the dynamics of what it means to, to come into this new place where God is making his home in our lives, but the danger of being caught and going 
living as if we're still in that old country and living under those dynamics. And it is a time of transition. It's a time of difficulty and challenges in our lives, as we're going to see, and that's nothing new. It's like starting a new habit. Old habits are hard to break. So let's, let's begin here and look at verses 8 here, because the first thing that has to happen is you've got to walk away from that old home that you used to live in. And we saw that in those, you know, we understand that with immigrants. Uh, they, they are leaving something, and they don't plan on going back, not at least as a citizen or to live there. They may go back to visit relatives, but when they're leaving, they're leaving for good. They take all that they have, all that is important to them, and essentially it's their family and the clothes they have on their back, at least years ago it was, and they're moving to a new country. But they have to walk away from that which they knew wasn't going to be good for them. Paul talks about that in this book here. He begins in, or he writes in verse 8. Uh, and and the, he, he warns of the danger of, of coming into this new relationship with God, but in one sense, live, saying this is my new home, but continuing living as if the old way is still appropriate for us. He says, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So Paul is basically, what is going on in this, uh, this uh, Greek city is they, they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and many of them responded. Uh, they, they understood that Jesus was, he was taught and preached that he was God coming in the flesh, fully human and yet fully divine, and that he came and he, he, he lived a perfect life, and he lived that perfect life in order that those rewards would count for people who believed in him. And then, of course, as we know, he went to the cross. And on that cross was nailed our sins with him. And the benefit of that death counts for us. Now, they knew that. They were taught that. But something was going on there. There were teachers, false teachers, coming into the church and introducing new ideas. We talked a little bit about that uh, last week and, and next week you'll hear more about some of the false teachings. But false teachings were coming in to the church and they were causing great harm, they are causing uh, discouragement, they are causing people to lose their belief in the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ and in, in the fact that you had to add some kind of human effort into it. So let's look at this. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Great word, um, the, the interesting word is this, take captive. It's a, it's a word that describes a foreign army that comes in there and captures people as if they're the reward or booty, and they bring them back as captives. And the idea here is these false teachers are coming in here, and they are like people stealers. They're stealing people away from Christ, and they're adding them into this cult-like experience where they are now in spiritually enslaved. And they're no longer free in Christ because they're being told it's not just what Christ does for you, but it's also what you do for yourself. And that's the, essentially what one of the problems was there. But he's saying these people are taking you captive by philosophies, worldly philosophy. Now, the word philosophy is nothing wrong uh, with that. It just means the love of wisdom. That's what the word philosophy means. And there's nothing wrong with loving ideas and, and pursuing thoughts and pursuing understanding and, and being in love with wisdom. In fact, if you the whole book of Proverbs in the Old Testament is that encouragement to love wisdom. So there's nothing wrong with this idea of philosophy. What is wrong here is that it's an empty, deceitful philosophy. Empty means it promises you things, but when you open up the package, it's there's nothing there as far as spiritual truth and wellness, and it's deceitful. It's like these uh, rain or dark clouds that come over a, a dry, thirsty land, and you think, oh my goodness, it's going to rain, and you have this hope, but the next thing you know, it just blows away and doesn't even leave a drop of water for you. So it's that deceitful thing. It's these, these promises that if you, if you follow these teachings here, you will have this fulfillment of life. You will have an abundant life. You will have all that you dreamed of, but essentially here, it's teachings that are according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirits of the world. And those two phrases there speak of both human 
ideas, and the human idea is essentially uh, egocentric, right? It's, it's, I'm in charge. I can be my own God, and I will determine right from wrong, and, and I will do this, and God will accept me, because that's what I determined. And those are the human traditions. But the elemental spirits of the world really speak about demonic influence and activities. Elemental means the baseness. And, the, and when, whenever you think of a, a spiritual influence, essentially what they're always going to lead to is the inefficiency of Jesus Christ. That he isn't enough. That he is deceitful. That you don't need Jesus Christ. So human traditions and these elemental spiritual uh, teachings work together. Humans love to be empowered. They love to build up their ego. They love to say, I know how to do it, follow me. I don't need God, or I only need part of what God is teaching. I'll take parts of what Jesus did, but I will add to that my own ability. And of course, that is influenced by demonic activity, because, and they will, they're the ones who influence mankind into seeing Jesus Christ as not enough, falling short. And so what Paul is warning here is that if these philosophies are not according to Christ, beware of them. And what does it mean to be according to Christ? I mean, are we just talking about only the words that Jesus spoke? Well, no, we have to encompass the entire of scriptures because the entirety of scriptures come from Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired of God, and if Jesus is God, which the scriptures teach us and which we believe, then what we're talking about is human philosophies that are contrary to what we learn in here are deceptive, they're empty, and they're demonically influenced in people's lives. When you think about uh, some of the false teachings that seem to permeate our culture today, I I'm going to suggest three of them that, 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 that you're all aware of. And number one, here, I'm not saying it's number one as the most important, but the first one is the idea that all religions eventually lead to where? Heaven, right? I mean, they're, they're going, it's like you want to go to California, you go this way, I'll go that way, and we'll meet in San Francisco, right? You'll get your way, I know a better way. Yours is going to be more troublesome. I'm taking the easy way. I'm flying, you're walking, whatever it is, but we're all going to get to California, right? And so that's essentially what the, one of the false teachings, the elemental human idea and uh, spirit, fallen spirits influence in people's lives is that you can believe with what you want, I'll believe what I want. It doesn't really matter. We have to respect one another. In fact, some people even have the, uh, uh, their bumper stickers, you know, this coexist, and it's all these emblems of all these religions, and the implication is, you know, you're all fooling one another. No one is special. No one is going to get there above anybody else. You're all going to get there, whether you're Buddhist, follow Hindu teaching, if you're a spiritist, or if you're is, uh, a follower of Islam, or, or, or Judaism, or fill in the blank. You're all going there the same way. The problem with that is it, it is powerfully uh, denied within the scriptures. Jesus says, I am the way. Can you finish that for me? The truth and the light. And? Well, then I don't need to teach anymore because you all got it. And that's the truth. And you have to believe in that. Either Jesus said that or he didn't say it. But we have the scriptures that date back thousands of years that say he did say it. And either he was a liar or what are those three things? Liar, lunatic, or Lord. Did he lie? He, it doesn't come across his character, right? Was he a lunatic? He never spoke or acted like a lunatic, but he claimed to be Lord. And so this idea, and that's one of the elemental uh, lies that is permeating our culture. Another one is this, that your wellness in life, your physical wellness, or your uh, prosperity in life is there's a strict or a, a, a real correlation between how well you're living and God's approval of you, right? 
that if you're doing well in life, it's because you are doing well with God and God is pleased with you. Therefore, he's going to reward you better paying jobs, good health, and things like that. That's another one of the elemental lies. And so when you're sick or you lose your job or you're struggling financially, you turn inward and say, what am I doing wrong, God? If you'll just show me what I have to do, I'll do it. That's another lie. It's not taught in scriptures. Some of us will always be poor. Some of us will be middle class. Some of us might be upper class. And there's no sin in trying to improve your life. But there's never a correlation in the New Testament that spoke of the fact that when you're doing well physically, you know, your good health is because God likes you and loves you. When you're doing well financially, it's because God likes you. That's not taught. The third big lie in, in the uh, scriptures, now I've got to look this one up because I forgot. Is all will be forgiven. Will you forgive me for forgetting? Well, listen, if God loves, right? Since God loves, a loving God would never condemn somebody, right? Because love always forgives. And so as long as you're sincere in life, as long as you believe and are sincere or, or you try the best you can, you know, you'd forgive yourself, wouldn't you? Because you're not as bad as the people down the road or in the other part of the world or things like that. So you need to be forgiven because God is love and God forgives. That's also not taught in scriptures. God does not forgive because he loves you. Okay? He w does not forgive you because he loves you. Why does he forgive you? What? Because Jesus paid the price. Who said that? There you go, my brilliant student in the back. Because Jesus died for you. Now his love brought Jesus to die for you, right? But he doesn't forgive because he loves. He forgives because the penalty of your sin was paid for, which we're going to learn about here. The next part here is that, you know, we were walking away from this home. Uh, when my son and daughter sold their home, they just didn't become homeless. They already had a new home to walk into, all right? They had a new home. They moved into it. We are going to walk into this new home. Let's look at verses 9 through 12 together here. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is ahead of all rule and authority. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So in this passage, he's talking about in Christ the fullness of deity lives and, uh, the, and Christ lives in us. He's made his home in us. And as a result of this new home, certain legal things has happened to us. He speaks about two things, this circumcision and baptism. And one thing that comes out in this passage here is the both acts, the circumcision is the cutting away of the flesh in a, in a male child at eight days old in Israel's history. It was a sign of the covenant. We don't practice it today in or, as a religious rite. But Judaism still does, and I believe Islam still practices it. Okay? The other term here is baptism. Baptism, it's a word that literally means being placed into. You're placed into, and we practice water baptism, not for the forgiveness of sin, but to demonstrate that we are forgiven. We go into the water as Christ went into the grave, and as, as we come out of the water as Christ was raised from the grave. It's a death to the old way and a new life. But in this passage here, it is not talking about any human action. These are all God's actions. And the truth of it is, when we baptize, all we're doing is reflecting in an outward act what has happened to us inward. So let's talk about what does it mean to be circumcised. It says here in verse 10, or 9, he said, or 11, I'm sorry. In him you were, you were circumcised with the circumcision without, made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So circumcision literally means the cutting away. 
So what he's talking about here is when you came into Christ by faith, God did something that you could not do. He cut away from you that old nature. He severed the ties. It was like it used to be glued to you, and now he put dissolvent in it, and it's no longer glued to you. It's very powerful in your life still. It can be, but now it can be cast off, and the term being cast away is a term that is also used to describe the taking off of old, dirty clothes and throwing them away. You look at them and say, that's not even worth trying to wash. They are so corrupted with dirt and filth and disease. I want nothing to do with it. You strip those clothes off, and you cast them away. And what he's talking about here is casting away uh, that flesh, that old nature, which is symbolic about our rebellion, rebellion against God and about our, sense, uh, our, our narcissistic tendencies, that sense of it's about me, I use people for me, I take advantage of people for me, I exalt myself even above God. And I shake my fist at God and his rule in my life. I want nothing to do with God. But then when he quickens us and makes us alive, he cuts that off. Now we can go and choose to go live in that old home again where that flesh dominates, but we don't have to. He's given us a new home. And so this is something God does in us. He cuts away that old flesh. And then he baptizes us. And again, our water baptism is nothing but a picture of what he does to us. So understand that baptism means to be placed into. We place into water. What he does is he places us into a number of things. I'll try to remember them. He places us into the body of Christ. Legally. You now belong, now, by that I mean you are now an adopted child of God. You belong to him legally. There is paperwork in heaven that declares that you are now a child of God. It's called the book of life. Your name is there. You are legally adopted by God. Whether you feel like it or not, you belong with him. You can run away. You can pretend you're an orphan, but you're no longer an orphan. You've been baptized, placed into the body of Christ. But another thing you've been baptized into, and that is the death of Jesus, when he went to the cross, guess who went there with him? You did, and I did. He legally, in heaven, took our debt, our sins, and it went with Christ on that cross. We were buried, baptized with him. We were buried, baptized into his death. His death is now our death. And then his new life, his resurrection, we have been baptized into his resurrection. In other words, when he rose from the dead and it, to never die again, that is us also. And we live that way. But I want to go back to this passage here. We're in the very beginning where he says this here. He says, um, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells, and you have been filled in him with the, who is ahead over all rule and authority. And quickly, the rule and authority are, spirit, are terms of spiritual dem demonic positions of authority under Satan. But look at this passage here. Is that big enough for you to read? I guess so. I'll, here, I'll read it for you. It says, now, each one of these things are just saying the same verse in different ways, which I liked. Okay? It says, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If there's anything about God, any characteristic about God, that same characteristic is about Jesus. There is no difference in character between the Father and the Son or the Holy Spirit. Another way he says, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, in Christ. Uh, I heard this from my wife when she teaches this to young kids. It's uh, Jesus is God with skin on him. Okay? I, I like that. It's such a powerful way to say it. Jesus is God that you can touch and feel and see. And some of you will try to hug him, I know, and he will let you when you get to heaven. You will feel him. All the essential essence of deity inhabits him in bodily form. There is nothing about God that is not in Jesus Christ. His omniscience, his omnipotence, his power, his ever-present. I know when he was on earth, he was uh, local 
and he denied many of these things, but in essence, if, it's, if you think about what God is like, you'll find, if it's biblical, you'll find it in Jesus. The entire fullness of God, whole, God's whole nature dwells in bodily form, and you are made complete in him. Now, what that means is this here. It means that apart from God, you are dying, you are, you are separated, you are corrupt, you are not a, a full human as God meant you to be. You are lacking something. You will not find fulfillment. You will not find meaning in life. You will not find a sense of significance and value until you come to Christ. And in Christ, that's where you find your value and your significance and your meaning in life and your hope and security. And you will not find it anywhere else. The world will tell you that you'll find it in a new thing and a bigger thing and a better thing. But all that is temporary. It might give you a a high for a few minutes, but it won't last. So let me ask you about something here. Do you understand, can you comprehend the significance of what this is saying? That the fullness of God, he says it here in the ESV here, you have been filled in him who is a head of all rule and authority. Do you understand, can you comprehend what that means? Does the significance of that just kind of, yeah, I get it. Because if it makes sense to you, you're smarter than me. Because, and I'm not that smart anyway, but anyway. Um, I, I can't comprehend this. The fullness of deity is in me right now and in you. Here we go. This is um, Niagara Falls. Have you ever been there? I've been there a couple times. I wanted to um, use this. I, Niagara Falls is one of my favorite illustrations because there's so many ways I can use this thing. You know, the grace of God being poured into your life, overwhelming and things like that, never-ending source and all those things. Like, but today I, wanna, I want you to look at this and say, that water represents God and the fullness of God that's being poured over into your life. What if you were given, when I think about the fullness of God living in me, I think about how can I comprehend or catch that. It's, it's if I was given this cup, my Harley Davidson cup, and I get into a boat at the bottom of that, and I'm instructed, I want you to catch all the water that's falling over the falls in your cup. I mean, that would just rip my arm off, right? And I say, listen, I can grab this much water, but where's the rest of it going? And the instruction is, no, that's God. I want you to capture all of it in this little cup. And you say, well, it can't happen. I, I'm saying, you're right, it can't. You can't do it. You can't capture God in your life. You don't have the ability, I don't have the ability, to capture all that God is. Here's another picture. I'll give you an illustration here. If you've ever been to the ocean, there's a lot of water. So again, you're given this cup and you're saying, I want you to have the fullness of God and this ocean is God, and so I want you to take this cup and drink all the ocean. Keep dipping it in there and keep drinking it. How much can you drink? Assuming it wasn't salt water. One or two cups and you're done. Say, I got enough of you, God. And God says, no, you don't have enough of me. See, this is what we have to understand. There's, there's no human ability to absorb all that God is. This is something that only God can do. Only God could come in and be a man and a human in Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she was in, became pregnant, gave birth to Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. Only God could do that. And only God can place himself in you fully. And if this does represent God, <coughs> I want you to understand something. It's all in you. It's not like there's a million of us and we all take a drink, we all get parts of God. I'll take a part of God, you get a part of God. There's so much of God to go around, everybody gets to drink of him, right? No, he has poured all of him into you. Now, going back to this question then. <clears throat> what is the significance of that for you? What should be the significance of that for you? What should be the power of what should powerfully affect you, knowing that the fullness of deity lives within you? Should it have an effect on your life? Should it 
do something for us. Well, let me ask you, what is it? What does it do for you day by day? <coughs> Excuse me. Anything. I don't worry anymore. You don't worry anymore. I still worry, but that's a great answer. I, don't, I still worry because I keep going back to the old home to live. That's a great answer. What else should it be doing for us regularly? We should love others more because of all that. I mean, God is love. What else should it be doing for us? We shouldn't fear. Then why do I fear? Why don't I love you all like I should? I'm going to lead, that's going to lead us into this next passage here. What else should it be doing for us? We have God's power. Yeah, we have God's power. Maybe we should be a little bit less chasing after human dreams. It's okay to pursue things. Don't get me wrong. It's okay to try to improve your life, but they shouldn't overwhelm us because God, it's like, yeah, you can go after that, but you know, you got so much more going on within you right now if you don't only stop and pause and dwell upon that. So let's look at this next idea here, being reborn in that new home. And, and essentially what I'm saying here is that what it means to be born again is this. Jesus in John chapter 3 was talking to Nicodemus, this great religious teacher, uh, and, and said to Nicodemus, uh, you must be born again. You must be born again. And so... <coughs> Churches have tried to understand what does that mean. Well, it means being, for some, it's taking communion or it's being baptized and this and that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about because he talked about the Spirit of God going where it will and, and coming where people don't know where it's going or where it's coming, but it comes upon you and something powerful happens. And it's what we spoke upon. There is a spiritual circumcision that goes on where the old sins are, are, are the sin natures cut away from you. And you were baptized or placed into the body of Christ and now you're a child of God because you accepted Jesus as your Savior. You are born again. You have that new spirit living in you. But you have to learn how to live in this new home. Okay, let's look at verses 13 and 15 together. <clears throat> he says here, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, quickly, verse 15, he's talking about rulers and authorities, a spiritual Entities, uh, those fallen angels who are given these ranks under Satan and he has triumphed over them and they no longer have the power to triumph over us. But let me go back here and look at these verses here. When you were dead in the transgressions and the uncircumcision of your heart, he made you alive together with him. He does not make you alive to live apart from him. He doesn't give you hope for eternity. He doesn't forgive your sins. <coughs> so that you can go on as if he doesn't exist. You don't get married to somebody and then continue to live as if you're not married to them. Essentially, so he, you are dead in your transgressions. In other words, he's saying spiritually dead, physically dying, because we are dying in this world. Okay? But you were dead towards God. You had no connection with him. You weren't receiving any life to him because your back was turned towards him and your faith was in your own ability and, your, and, and actually your faith was in the laws that you were breaking. The laws of God. I find life in doing things that God told me not to do, but you weren't finding life in them. But he made you alive. And that word made alive is, is, is a word that it's, it's challenging for Students of the Bible, it just says he quickens you. It's, it's almost like you're being plugged in into electrical current and it's pouring into your life. And that, that spiritual current comes in you and it makes you alive. You cannot make yourself alive. Only God makes you alive when you come to him in faith, believing in him. And he made you alive together with him in order to live with him and to be with him and no longer independent with him, having forgiven all our transgressions. 
And look what he said. He, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The imagery I see here is that, you know, I get this, these written documents in my mind in heaven. There's these written documents of, of the things that I've done wrong. They're there. They're recorded. And, and God took those things and he, he nailed them to the cross so that they are now forgiven and the debt has been paid for. We see that in human courts today. Uh, there's nothing done in a human court without it being written down, right? I mean, they have these, uh, what do you call these people, men or women, who transcribers, and how do they do that? They, can, they just transcribe things, and they, they, every word that's uttered, unless the judge says, strike that. Okay, so now the judge is saying, strike those things. Wipe them out. They're no longer evidence against you. Anything that alienated you from God from the very beginning to the very end has been taken care of. The sins that I will commit tomorrow that I'm planning, no, I'm not planning on it. <clears throat> By God's grace, I plan not to, but the sins that I commit tomorrow are already forgiven. But I should go to him and ask forgiveness for that personal relationship thing here. But they're forgiven from the day one to the day end. They've been nailed to the cross, and, and that's the promise we have. And so what Paul is writing to these people in, in the city, he's writing to them, don't believe these people that say you still have to do something more to win God's approval or his acceptance. You have to be a better person. And God says, you can't be better. I've got the better person, Jesus. He did it for you. Well, you have to deny yourself things. And again, we'll hear more about these uh, <coughs> wrong philosophies next week. But, but he's saying that it's all finished. Christ is fully sufficient for this. There's nothing he needs that you need to do to add to that. If I can use my illustration of home moving again. <laughs> um, Interesting thing here, and, and I know this illustration will fall apart for some of you smart Alex out there, but just bear with me here. When you buy, when you own a home and you want to buy a new home, what must you, what will the mortgage company make you do before you can sign paperwork for the new home? What's that? No, you got to sell the old home. I knew you didn't know where I was going. Unless you're rich or you're going to rent it out, I get it. But they won't let you, when you go to the title company, the first thing you have to do is sign documents selling the old home first, right? Am I right? They won't let you sign papers for the new home while you still have this mortgage due for the old home. And why is that? Because you are, if you're normal like me, you're limited in what you can afford. You can't make payments at both. You can only make payments on one. Unless I know if you're wealthy, or you're going to rent it out, just put that to the side. I'm just saying this, that you have to cut off the old home payments first because you have only so much to give and it's going to go to the new home. But spiritually speaking, sometimes our energy continues to go where? It's like we're going in that old home that is no longer ours, we're opening up the door, we're opening up the refrigerator, we're trying to eat the food and sleep in the bed and in a home that, no, that we no longer belong to. And what does the new owner think about that? They don't like that, do they? They don't like that at all. They say, no, this is my home. You're trespassing. Put my cheeseburger back in the refrigerator. That's my leftover, whatever it is. You're going to get in trouble. We get in trouble spiritually when we try to live in that old way of finding significance and value or proving our worth before God in a very narcissistic way when we don't live there anymore. We've moved out. Stop going back to that old way. But it's hard, isn't it? Because you have to, my, my daughter was telling me the kids uh, the first night in their new home, or all of them took turns waking up confused about where they were, right? They're tired, they weren't sleeping very well, and they have to get used to things. And it's a, it's a different house, different rooms, and the beds are not in the same rooms and things like that. And it's a different backyard. Everything is different. But they will grow to love it. But if they go back to that old home, they're they're not going to be able to live there anymore. So people, friends, children of God, we need to all stop living like we're still children of this world. Stop trying to prove ourselves worthy to God. Stop trying to prove ourselves valuable to God. Accept the fact that you're valuable and your significance, 
Your significance is you're made in the image of God. Your value is placed in the fact that you belong to God. There's nothing you can do or need to do about it. Jesus is all sufficient. The fullness of deity lives in him. Jesus lives in you and his spirit. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the truth and the encouragement that we hear from your word. I pray that we can all, by the power of your spirit, live that new life. Live with hope, live without fear, live with the power that you give us, and stop trying to live in our old ways. We've, we're, we've migrated to a new home. We're taking all that we belong with us, and we're trusting in you. Help us to enjoy and find fulfillment in this new life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.